All right, guys, welcome back as we continue to study Numbers 10 and 11, Lesson 79. It's nice to have Taylor back in the, in the room. Rich has slid over a couple seats. Jeff is in another state. We've got Kevin. We've got Tom. We got the whole crew ready to dig into the Word of God. And in Numbers 10, remember this. We're talking about silver trumpets. Like, to me... I just love this image in Numbers 10, verses 1 through 10, about calling people together. Hey, if I blow the trumpets, we're going to come together for war. If I blow the trumpets, we're going to come for festivals. If I blow them shorter or if I blow them longer, like it's all about getting people ready. And what I love about this is, is that they're not just depending upon the cloud. Remember yesterday, we talked about the cloud, how the, the cloud always leads, uh, you know, uh, the people, the Israelites. But now with the, the trumpets, it's kind of like, just in case you missed the cloud, <laughs> I want to make sure you guys understand the trumpets are essential as well. Now think about how else do we hear from the Lord? We hear from the Lord through the Word of God. We hear through the, uh, you know, from the Lord through the Holy Spirit. We hear from people that, that give us counsel and wisdom, maybe from a pastor or a teacher. So there's multiple ways that you can hear from the Lord. And that's what I love about what the silver trumpets do. They're telling us, guys, I need us to get together. Now, I cannot pass over. I, I got to do this. I know we're going we're gonna to plow through Numbers 11, but I got to talk about how these silver trumpets point to the ultimate picture. I mean, Kevin, if you would, would you go to 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17? So here these silver trumpets are calling the Israelites together. You got 2 million people, man. You got to have a guy that can seriously blow the trumpet. So Bill Etter, I love that you're always practicing in Flint, Michigan. I love that, RJ, you're always practicing blowing the shofar. But now watch what the ultimate picture in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. With the archangel's arc angle. There's a little angle, 45 degree, with the archangel's voice. And with the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will, will rise first. Verse 17. Then we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Remember, every eye, it says in Revelation, is going to see the Lord coming. And in just in case you miss the, 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 the cloud, we're going to blow the trumpet so everybody hears. It's kind of the same image. Isn't this an awesome picture of the Old Testament, how it points to the New Testament? I just, I didn't want to jump into Numbers 11 without us catching how the trumpets are pointing to the Messiah. The silver trumpets, and then ultimately in 1 Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul says, oh, by the way, there's going to be another trumpet. It's going to be the sound of, of heaven, and he's coming back. And so as everybody comes together, now I think this is an interesting image, you know, you know, how many times does the Lord have to tell the Israelites something, right? He has to tell them over and over again, guys, by the way, I need you to observe Passover. I need you to observe what I'm asking you to remember what, what I've done in, in your presence. Because remember, Kevin, if you would, would you go to Exodus 15, 22 through 24? Uh, this happened right away. You know, here they traveled for three days from their deliverance in Egypt, three days after they had been delivered. And, and watch what starts happening. Then Moses led Israel on from the Red Sea and they went out to the wilderness of Shur, Sure, sure. They journeyed for three days in the wilderness without finding water. Now watch in verse 23. They, they had just been set free in, in, the, in the Red Sea. They had just been set free from being slaves. And they came to Mara, but they could not drink the water at Mara because it was bitter. That's why it was named Mara. Now watch in verse 24. And the people grumbled to Moses, what are we going to drink? Three days. The Israelites have been set free and they have the audacity to complain. Hey, by the way, God, I need some water. Now watch. That's what happened in Exodus 15. Now here it is again. We're going to see the same model. It's like these boneheads haven't learned. And here's the deal. We're the same way. Over and over, we see something God does and then we forget. And we're going to see the people, the Jewish people complain. In Ex uh, Numbers 11, verse 1, it says, Now the people began complaining openly. In other words, they're not hiding it. You know, there's no more quiet grumbling. They're like, hey! <laughs> A little bit of an attitude. And they openly are complaining before the Lord about the hardship. And when the Lord heard, his anger burned, and the fire from the Lord blazed among them and consumed the outskirts of the camp. By the way, I'm going to send some fire to let you know I'm here. I'm going to send some fire to let you know I'm I'm angry. And in verse 2, then the people cried out to Moses, <laughs> Oh no, I wish we wouldn't have complained openly. And they, they cried out to Moses. I think that's an interesting thing. What do you observe about that one little line? They didn't go to God. They didn't cry out to the Lord. They went to the leader. And then Moses prayed to the Lord, and then the fire died down. Isn't that cool? Lord, I, I just, will you get them to shut up, please? And will you get this fire to die down? 
And, and, and it does. Watch. Uh, the fire died down in verse 3. So that place was named Tabara because the Lord's fire had blazed among them. Kevin, can you go to Romans 8, 28? I want to take a little bit of... I know they didn't know Romans 8, 28, but they didn't have any faith. He just brought them through this miraculous adventure. And they don't believe that God can put all this together. I'm going to bring you through the wilderness. I'm going to bring you through the sea. And oh, by the way, I'll, I'll give you water. It'll be filtered. It'll be fine. <clears throat> Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God. Everything comes together if you love him, even if it's bleak and you can't figure this out. Just quit your complaining and love God, because if you love God and don't complain, he says, I'm going to put it together to those who are called according to his purpose. And so there's this place called Tabra because the Lord's fire had, had, had burned down among his people. I believe he was sending a warning, and I believe, as Nelson says, was purifying as well. He's sending both. I, it doesn't say this, but I wonder if it caught a little of the complainer's you know, robes. I wonder if it caught a little bit of their camels. You know, just like, aha, I'm here. I hear you complaining. Like, God, you know, I just think sometimes, I, man, I'd just send a little fire and I'd send it hard. <laughs> that come across a little forward? Uh, well, I'm glad you're not the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm glad I'm not Moses either because Moses prayed on behalf of them, right? And so now in verse 4, now watch this. Here, this is interesting. Contemptible people among them had a strong craving for other food. So now they're, they're not, they're complaining about what? They're complaining about the hardships. They're complaining about dealing with like, you know, the, the water stuff, the food stuff. And, and then it says, contemptible people among them had a strong craving for other food. The Israelites cried again and said, who will feed us meat? Dear Lord. It just happened. Have they forgotten already that fire just fell? Yeah, I, I would not intercede. <laughs> I'm just saying. Now, just so you know, the mixed people, Taylor, we were talking about like these, the foreigners that sometimes came over in between our breaks. You know, these are the people that escaped from slavery, but they weren't Israelites. In Exodus 12, verse 38, if you'll go there, Kevin, Exodus 12, verse 38, the contemptible people, these are the, the foreigners, an ethnically diverse crowd also went up with them along with a huge number of livestock, both flocks and herds. So this is the crowd right here this ethnically diverse crowd, this group of foreigners. And so they're saying, after eating a year of manna, could I please get some pizza? Could I please get some shawarma? How about a falafel, please, here, God? Like, I mean, that's what they're saying. Who, who's going to give us this meat? Now, this might be one of the funniest verses in Scripture. In verse 5 of Numbers 11, we remember the free fish when we ate in Egypt. Oh, do you remember the cucumbers and the melons? And the leeks and the onions, oh my, like, do you remember the garlic? And it was just like they're sitting in the wilderness and they're processing all of this food that they probably like, but it probably wasn't the best back then. Anything's better than daily manna. Anything is better than, than what we could have. And, and now watch, they're so drastic. I love when complainers go to the extreme. But now our appetite is gone. <laughs> There's nothing to look at but this manna, like, Please stop. Let me looking at this manna. And I love this. And it's kind of crazy to me because honestly, this attitude, it continues all the way. Kevin, can you go to Numbers 21.5? Ten chapters. These Israelites keep complaining. These foreigners within the camp, they keep complaining. It's just kind of like nonstop. The people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you led us up from Egypt to die in the wilderness? There's no bread or water and we detest this wretched food. In other words, they don't change in 10 chapters. Oh, Warren Wearsby, he describes what has happened. Like, not everybody is like this, I don't think, though. I think there's just these little weasels that have just crept in and are complaining. Warren Wearsby says, Jesus plants his children and Satan plants his counterfeits. And I think what begins to happen is, is that you have to be careful to not go to the, to the enemy side, you have to be careful not to fall into the ways of the world, the flesh, and of Satan, because then you begin to forget how God is, and I, I love this, remember how, how God is our spiritual rock. God is our rock. God is what will get us there. God will provide the water for us. God will constantly be with us. But if we forget and then we start complaining, we fall to the side, yes, of the enemy. I, is that too extreme to say that? No, I don't think so. I feel like as soon as you start complaining, you quit the, the trust factor in God. 
And over and over again, if you're not careful, then what happens is, and, and this, I'm going to go extreme, okay? Just let me go extreme for a second. Let me get on my soapbox and I'm going to go there for about 10 minutes. And I don't even care because I think this is why we need a move of God. I think this is why we need a revival. We have people in the church, in the American church, that are constantly complaining. And so then what they do is they come up with their own things. They manufacture their own things rather than depending upon the Lord. And then what happens is the false brethren, and false teachers start creeping in because they don't like to depend upon him, but they'd rather become their own rock. They'd rather become their own substance. And then what happens is that that starts fill, uh, carrying over into the other churches and starts carrying over into our communities. That's why we're in a desperate need of a move of God. Why do you think we're seeing constant shootings in our country? Because the church isn't stepping up and depending upon the rock of God. What we've done is we've created our own rocks. We're pointing to the gun situation. It's not the gun situation. It's a sin situation. And over and over and over again, if you're not careful, you have forgotten what we've done. You know, in, in Washington, D.C., there's the Museum of the Bible. And they have this, uh, this, this flyover simulator. And it flies over all of Washington, D.C. And you know what it does? It shows you scripture verses on all of the buildings throughout Washington, D.C about how God is planted on our foundation in this country. And then over the course of time, you know what we say? I don't need that scripture. I don't need that stuff. And we create our own rock. I'm telling you, sometimes we're no different in the church with this right here. If we don't remember what God's done for our country, if we don't remember what God's done for us, if we don't remember what God has done and how he has saved my salvation. In 2 Peter 2, Kevin, if you'll go there, 1 and 2, this is the, this is the mindset of the parable of the terrors, right? That, you know, you have uh, the one or the other. You have the sheep or the goats. In 2 Peter 2, 1 and 2, it says, But there are also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly bring in destructive heresies. It, it, and to me, you know what a heresy is here? Oh, hey, I don't, we don't like this food. We want more food. We want different food. And you can say, Kyle, that's really extreme, but I'm telling you, that's how it starts. You start creating your own little world, and then you know what happens? You start to form your own Israel. You start to form your own church. Just because you didn't like one thing, you start something else. Why do you think we have thousands of denominations in our country? Because we created our own little things. At some point, Scripture says, people will go to even denying the master who bought them and will bring swift destruction on themselves in verse 2. Many will follow their unrestrained ways and the way of truth will be blasphemed because of them. Watch out for false teachers and prophets because they, they do their own thing. And you can say, man, Kyle, I can't believe you just went from complaining about food. I'm telling you, the second that you start looking to your own strength, your own dependence and not to the Lord, I'm telling you, be careful. A couple other scenarios, Galatians 2 verse 4. Not just taught false teachers and false prophets, but there's going to be false brethren among us. This issue arose because a false brother smuggled in who came in to secretly spy on the freedom that we have in Christ in order to enslave us. So sometimes what happens, you guys, is that people come within the church. You know, the number one issue, you guys, that we face as we travel over the United States is, is who? The church. It's not the lost. The lost aren't all like, hey, beat it. Sometimes they are. But the reality is, is that people come in just to see if I screw up on my teaching. You know that, right? Sometimes people come in and say, oh, I heard one thing. And they just come in to try to enslave us, to put us into bondage. Man, there's freedom. You've got to watch out for the false brothers. Scripture continues also. There's, there's false ministers and false apostles in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13. This comes from, yes, just people complaining. And I'm telling you, that's how it starts at times. 2 Corinthians 11, 13. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. I'm just telling you as Christ is getting ready to come back on the cloud, as we have to be ready and ready and ready and ready. <laughs> we also have to be ready and watchful that, that people around us aren't trying to deceive us. They aren't trying to um, disguise themselves as light, as it says in 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14. And no wonder, for Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. Be careful, church. And then in one more verse, if we can, I want you to go to Jude uh, verse 4. Obviously, there's one chapter, Jude 1 verse 4. And just one more picture of people are, are sneaking in. For some men who were designated for this judgment long ago have come in by stealth. They're going to secretly come in and they've come in by stealth. They're ungodly, turning the grace of our God into promiscuity and denying Jesus Christ, our only master and Lord. So obviously, I'm going to the extreme here in the sense that, you know, if you're not careful, that complaining card could lead to denying Christ. And you're like, whoa, that's extreme. It's happening in America. 
I'll just tell you this, we've had partnering churches just in the last couple months, you guys, that we have poured into in the United States that have completely, blatantly turned away from the Word of God and are saying homosexuality is okay. That would be false teaching. Those are the kind of things that we have to be careful about just because we want to appease our community. Yeah, you love everybody, but you still tell them the truth. And all because in verse 6, they say their appetite's gone and they want something else. When you don't depend upon the Word of God, when you don't depend upon His trust, it always leads to trouble. And Scripture continues on in verse 7, the manna... (laughs) The manna resembled coriander seed. And did I say that right? Coriander? Coriander. Coriander seed and its appearance was like of, oh boy, rich? Bed, bedulum? My version says resin. Okay, I like that better. <laughs> it was that of resin. Uh, the people walked around and gathered it. They, they ground it on a pair of grinding stones or crushed it in a, on a mortar, then boiled it in a cooking pot and shaped it into cakes. It tasted like a pastry cake cooked with the finest oil. And I love this. And when the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna would fall with it. I mean, what is he saying here, you guys? It was there. And it was good. They didn't have to do anything for it. No. Praise the Lord. Just given to him. I mean, I know we would get, it would get old. Can you imagine my wife be like, I don't have to cook today or tomorrow or for the next 40 years. <laughs> I get there's complaining, but like he provides. It might not have been a crazy abundance. It was just what we needed. And this manna, you guys, it appeared for six days, right? Every week. And then on the seventh day, no, because you had to collect enough on the sixth day. And then remember Exodus 16, verse 33, this manna was so important that these foreigners were mocking that God said, I never want you to forget how I provide. And in fact, Exodus uh, 16, verse 33 says, Moses told Aaron, take a container and put two quarts of manna in it. Then place it before the Lord to be preserved throughout your generation. So that whole Passover deal, I want you to observe. Oh, by the way, I want you to put two quarts of manna in a jar. I want you to have this golden pot, right, of manna. And I always want you to remember how I provided. Don't you dare mock the manna that I've provided. And for 40 years, and then finally in Exodus 16, verse 35, in Exodus 16, 35, it it stopped. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years. The manna from heaven fell. And so in verse 10, Moses is stuck in the middle of people complaining. Oh no, (laughs) what do I do with these people? (laughs) Moses heard the people, family after family, crying at the entrance of their tents. Does anybody think this is extreme now? Well, it went from contemptible people now. <laughs> now it's everybody. Everybody. Just a bunch of tantrums flying around in the camp. It's all I can picture. And in verse 11, Moses asked the Lord, Why have you brought these people to me? Why have you brought such trouble on your servant? Why are you angry with me? And why do you burden me with all these knuckleheads? Why do I cry with these people? Why do I have to deal with these people? It's an interesting translation you have there. Yeah, it's the Kyle version. It doesn't say knuckleheads, (laughs) but like, I would just be tired. In verse 12, look what he does. Did I I conceive all these people? Hello, I didn't give birth to them, you did. Did I give them birth so that you should tell me, carry them at your breast as a nursing woman carries a baby to the land that you swore to give their fathers? I love this picture because there's a couple times actually in the Old Testament that God is, whoa, here we go, dun, dun, dun. God is portrayed as, as a woman. I mean, that's what he's talking about right here. He's painting this picture of, God, did did I give birth to them? No, you gave birth to them. Does that make sense? Obviously, it's God the Father. But there's this image right here. Like, this is your baby. These are your people. They're not my people. And in verse 13, he says, where can I get meat to give all these people? Hello? I feel like the the disciples right now, the feeding of the 5,000. Like, I'm going to be able to provide them meat, right? Give us meat to eat. That's what they want. I can't carry all these people. They're, They're just too much. It is interesting, though, that he didn't necessarily inquire of the Lord, Lord, should I give them meat to eat? He just said, I want to give it to them because I want them to shut up. Yeah, I'm just done with them. <laughs> In verse 15 and on, if you're going to treat me like this, go ahead, just kill me, please. Please kill me right now. If you're pleased with me, <laughs> if you like what I've done so far for working for you, Lord, I would prefer that you kill me. In fact, Scripture says, don't let me see my misery anymore. Makes me think of Elijah, doesn't it? Kevin, can you go to 1 Kings 19.4? Remember Elijah? Poor Elijah. Same, same mentality. When these leaders get to a point, they hit a wall. And the challenge is, is do they die or do they keep going? But he went on a day's journey into the wilderness. I'm talking about Elijah. He sat down under a broom tree. I love the broom tree. 
and prayed that he might die. Lord, please kill me. <laughs> he said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life for I'm no better than my father's. Look, when you pour your heart out into these people, sometimes you just had enough. And Moses was, was done. And in verse 16, he got some help. The Lord said to Moses, Hey, bring me the 70 men from Israel, known to you as elders and officers of the people. Take them to the tent of the meeting and have them stand there with you. And then in verse 17, then I'll come down and I'll speak with you. Now, before I continue on, there's this discussion of who the 70 is. Either way, whoever the 70 is, I think this is the craziest, coolest picture. In verse 17, he says, I'm going to come down. You bring your men. I'll come and I'll take some of the spirit who is on you. What do you mean some of the spirit? Take some of the spirit who's on you and then... I'm going to put some of the spirit on them. And then they'll help you bear the burden of the people so that you don't have to bear it by yourselves. You know what I, he I see here? I'm going to take some of your anointing and I'm going to give some of them the anointing. I'm going to take what you have been empowered with and I'm going to help you by blessing them. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to tell them in verse 18, purify yourselves in readiness for tomorrow. Because why? I'm going to, I'm going to give you a whole lot of meat. You're going to have the buffet of all buffets. You better get ready because you cried out before the Lord, who's going to feed us meat? We really had it good in Egypt. And the Lord's going to give you meat. He's going to give you the meat that when you drive by the highway, if you eat all of it, it will be free. You guys remember those, those big steaks? <laughs> what are those, the 90 ounces? I don't know, whatever the things are. Like, I'm going to give you an abundance. You're going to eat not for one day. Oh man, he says, I have it coming for you guys. Not two days or five days or 10 days or in 20 days, but for a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes nauseating to you. Oh, you're going to get your meat all right. Because you've rejected the Lord who's among you and cried to him. Why did we ever leave Egypt? Great question. Don't ask it again. In verse 21, <laughs> but Moses replied, I'm in the middle of a people with 600,000 foot soldiers. Yet you say I'm going to give them meat and they're going to eat for a month. <laughs> and I love this. First of all, he rounded the number. You guys know it's really 603,550 is found in Numbers 146 and 232. So I just, I like this mentality. But where, where is the meat going to come from? I can only count so many camel. We can only eat so many things. I can only eat so many of these little animals. Are you kidding me? Who's doing this? And the Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's power unlimited? Limited, he says. Verse 23, you will see whether or not I, what I have promised to you will happen to you. In other words, Moses, it's game on. Oh, I'm so going to bring the meat. I just love this mentality of the Lord. Like, oh, you, you want to just watch Moses. And Moses went out and he told all the people, hey, by the way, the meat is coming. Hooray! And he brought 70 men from the elders of the people and he had them stand around the tent. And then the Lord, here it is, descended in the cloud. You guys, this is that cloud image we talked about in Numbers 9. And then he took some of the spirit that was on Moses and he placed it on some of the elders. And the spirit rested on them and they prophesied. Oh my goodness, you guys. They released the word. They began to praise him. They began to worship him. But they never did it again. I think that's interesting. That same thing happened, just so you know, in, in 1 Samuel 10. Uh, let's just go there really quick, Kevin. We're so not going to go where we're going to get to. But 1 Samuel 10, 9, this same prophecy mentality, it's, it's not about prediction, as one commentator says, Eugene Merrill. It's actually about uh, proclamation. It's about giving praise and expressions without what God's doing. And when Saul, he turned around to leave Samuel, in 1 Samuel 10, verse 9, God changed his heart and all the signs came about that day. Now watch in verse 10. When Saul and his attendant arrived at Gibeah, a group of prophets met him. Then the Spirit of God took control of him and he prophesied along with them. That's what happened to the 70 men. That's what happened to Moses. They began to praise the Lord. Hey, this is what's happening. This is what is taking place. And then in verse 26, two of the guys, I'm back in Numbers 11. I love this. They decided not to go to Moses. Two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other Medad. <laughs> And the Spirit rested on them. So all I know is that out of the 70, two of these guys, even though they didn't go, we don't know if it's disobedience or obedience. We don't know, but either way, the Spirit still rested on them. They were among those listed, but had not gone out to the tent. And they, they prophesied in the camp. So now they are in the presence of Moses, and some are in the presence of the camp. And one young man ran, and he came up to Moses. He said, hey, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, son of, Nun, assisted, uh, son of Nun, excuse me, assistant to Moses since his youth responded, My Lord, Moses, please stop them. This is the famous Joshua. And I love Moses' response in verse 29. Are you jealous on my account? It's fine. If only all the Lord's people were prophets and the Lord would place his spirit on them. In other words, if everybody would do what they're doing, it doesn't matter where they're at. It doesn't matter if they're here or matters if they're in the camp. 
Man, you guys, Scripture over and over again. I, I just have to say in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 1, I'm going to go out again, my rabbit trail here. I think this is the heart of all of us. This is the heart of the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 14, 1. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, and above all, that you may prophesy. Can I just cut to the chase, you guys? This right here, if you're supposed to pursue love, which I would say all of us agree we're supposed to, and the scripture says, and desire all spiritual gifts, then every one of us should bless you, uh, should prophesy. We should desire to prophesy. Because Moses says, no, this is a good thing. And then in verse 30, Moses, he returned to the camp along with the elders of Israel. And watch what happened in verse 31. Here the meat comes. A wind sent by the Lord came up and blew quail and from the sea and dropped them at the camp all around three feet off the ground, about a day's journey in every direction. And the people were up all that day and all that night and the next day gathering the quail. Can I just tell you this? Something that I missed when I first started studying this was, it says when they're gathering the quail, you guys understand, they're flying around. They're up all day and night because they have to catch them. <laughs> Got them. And then, you know, the twist in their heads like they are full on getting their food. But it's not just they didn't just die. They had to catch them. And the minimum that one who took gathered 33 bushels. Whew. That's a lot of quail. Man, that's a lot of quail. And they spread them out all around the camp. They were probably excited. Until verse 33, it says, While the meat was still between their teeth, before it was chewed, the Lord's anger burned. Their anger burned against the people, and the Lord struck them with a very severe plague. Whoa. Psalm 106, verse 15. As they're eating the meat, as they're doing what they asked for, and God gave it to them, he still gave them the plague, a very severe plague. And it says this, he gave them what they asked for, Psalmist wrote, but sent a wasting disease among them. Taylor, we talked about food poisoning. I actually think this could have been a version of it. In fact, uh, let's go to one more. I want to just prove this. Psalm 78, verse 31. Psalm 78, verse 31, Scripture says, God, anger flared up against them, and he killed some of their best men. It struck down Israel's choice young men. I'm telling you guys, the reality is the plagues were coming from the Lord. A wasting disease. He killed some of the best. In verse 34, so they named that place Kibroth Hatava, Hatava, because they buried the people who had craved the meat. From Kibroth Hatava, the people moved on to Hazaroth and remained there. The only thing I want to just, just close with is Warren Wearsby said, you know, discipline needs to happen. That when people begin to crave other than the Lord, God needs to step in. And that's exactly what happened with the people of God. We must depend not on the word or on the world, not on the flesh, not on things of the Satan, but we must depend upon the word of God. Jeremiah 15, 16 is a way I want to close. And there's so many ways that you could end this whole thing. But Jeremiah 15, 16, it just says, Your words were found and I ate them. Your words became a delight to me and the joy of my heart, for I am called by your name, Yahweh, God of hosts. Here's what a prophet does. Here's what a person of the word of God does. They depend upon God's word. And that should be satisfying enough. Numbers 11. There's a whole lot there. I pray. I pray that you're blessed because of Lesson 79. Thanks.